Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Kim Lisa Taylor. Thanks for being on the show, Kim. Hey, thanks a lot for the invitation, Whitney. So I've met Kim at numerous numerous conferences now, and obviously, you know, I knew that I had to have her on the show as a guest, and I've heard her on many other podcasts, and she provides tons of great content that I know our, our listeners will will gain lots of value from. So uh, Kim uh, is a founder of Syndication Attorneys PLLC, nationally recognized corporate securities attorney licensed in California and Florida. She has been the responsible attorney for over 300 real estate security securities offerings with raise amounts ranging from 500,000 to 100 million. Kim, you know, give us a little more about your background in real estate and, and what you're up to right now. Well, you know, I started out uh, a long time ago as a real estate litigator. I actually used to practice homeowner association law and uh, decided uh, early in that career that I did not, I didn't have the, uh, I guess I didn't have the right personality to be a litigator. You know, you got to really like, like to argue and fight with people and it just wasn't in my nature. So I started looking for something that I could do that, that still had a real estate component because I really loved real estate. My husband was a real estate investor and uh, we had uh, been in some real estate training classes on how to buy multifamily ourselves and we actually went out and did that. So, we, you know, I just kind of uh, fell into, uh, uh, went to a syndication event and learned how to, how to do it myself and then thought, gee, you know, I really like this area of the law and uh, started pursuing that and I've been doing it ever since. Nice, nice. So, so what, what is your focus right now? Um, so I'm building a law practice. I started this law practice, a uh, solo practice. I was in a partnership before with some other partners, but uh, started this practice, Syndication Attorneys, uh, the Florida company in uh, April of 2016. And my goal is to build and grow this firm and uh, make it the premier real estate syndication provider in the country. Nice. Nice. So we'll get into some other things that Kim and uh, her office are doing that are very exciting and uh, towards the end of the show. But uh, Kim, you know, obviously a lot of our guests are, are uh, in, just getting into the syndication business and, you know, they're going to be asking, uh, you know, you know, they're going to be fearful, right, of, of making a mistake, you know, getting into this business and doing that first syndication. You know, could you kind of lay out a few of the first things that, that big, biggest mistakes are that are very common that, that people usually miss? Well, you know, the first thing they need to do to, to gain comfort so they're not afraid of it and not afraid of making mistakes is to get knowledgeable about syndication. And the best way to do that is to read about it, you know, listen to podcasts just like this. Um, you know, there's a lot of information on our website that they can uh, look at for free. Uh, just, you know, do whatever you can to, to feel comfortable with the whole concept of syndication and what it means. And there's a lot of moving parts to it, uh, you know, so you've got to kind of figure out each one and how it all fits together. Um, and making sure that you have competent securities counsel that can guide you. Uh, one of our, you know, one of our common things is that we help people that have never syndicated before. So we feel that it's our job not to just you know, throw out some documents and say, here you go, but to help them understand what they're doing, why it's important, and, uh, you know, help them gain a deeper understanding each time they come back and do another deal so that they gain more confidence to be able to raise money. Uh, but as far as, like, the biggest mistakes that I see first-time syndicators doing is they're always looking for just one whale investor, one guy who's going to take down the deal, and uh, that really is the biggest mistake because you end up wasting a lot of time doing that. Uh, the, most of those people never pan out and you could have spent the same amount of time just talking to friends, family, and going out and networking and meeting people that would have invested with you 50 or $100,000 at a time and uh, actually made your deal successful. Nice. So, you know, on the, on the legal standpoint, you know, what's, what's going to be something that I really need to uh, be careful about that most people maybe overlook, you know, when they're 
Uh, I mean, obviously see people putting out offerings and, and posting things on social media, all the, all those things like that. What's going to get me in the biggest trouble the quickest that I need to know? Well, you have to have a really solid understanding of the securities laws that you are following because it's not just one securities law. There's uh, different exemptions. Uh, so well, if we just back up a little bit and you know, talking to people who don't even know what the word security is, what's a security? Well, a security is when you're, uh, selling interest in your company to other people uh, in exchange for their money and they're relying on you to make a profit. That's, that's really kind of the just simplest way that I can state it. Uh, or people who are in the business of repeatedly borrowing money from people are also uh, in the syndication business. They just don't know it. Um, so anytime that you're asking people for money and uh, they're expecting you to generate a profit is when you've fallen into the realm of securities laws. And what that means then is now that you're selling, so you're selling securities. And if you're gonna be selling securities, you either have to register your offering, which means you have to go get pre-approval from a regulatory agency before you can even ask anybody for money, or you have to qualify for an exemption from registration. And so the, the registration process is what companies go through when they do their initial public offerings. So you don't want to have to do a public offering. You can't afford to do that for real estate because it takes too much time. It costs too much money. It's not necessary. So your alternative is to choose an exemption from registration that will allow you to talk to people without having to get that pre-approved offering. And so there are a lot of different exemptions. Uh, there's exemptions at the state level if you were doing things all in one state and you weren't going to be, you know, you're, you, the properties and all your investors are in, say, Texas, then you would probably want to follow a Texas securities exemption. But if you're going to be crossing state lines and bringing in people from other states, uh, you're buying properties that are you know, outside your state, then you will probably be looking at one of the federal exemptions. And there's uh, several choices that you have at the federal exemption level. There's two that are very, very common. Um, it all, both of them are called Regulation D, Rule 506, but then there's two subparts to Rule 506, and you can choose between the two. The Rule 506B exemption is the original exemption that's been around since the 1980s, and uh, you know, thousands of uh, people have used it over the years. It's the same exemption that giant hedge funds use to raise you know, billions of dollars. Um, that exemption, however, doesn't allow you to advertise. It uh, only allows you to ask uh, for money from people who, with whom you've already have a, an established pre-existing relationship. So, so you can't post it on the internet. You can't stand up in front of a real estate investment club and say that you got a deal if you're doing this Rule 506B exemption. So the reason that people like the Rule 506B exemption still, though, is because it's the exemption that allows you to uh, invite your family and friends, some of whom may not be accredited investors. So you've got accredited investors, people who have over a million dollars net worth. Uh, or they make $200,000 a year income if they're single, $300,000 if they're married and file joint income tax returns. So that, that's the accredited investor. And you have people who don't meet those financial qualifications, and those are non-accredited investors. Well, with the 506B exemption, you are allowed to bring in up to 35 non-accredited investors in your deal. And most of our clients who've never done this before really need to focus on that group of non-accredited investors because that's probably the people that they know who will invest with them before they actually have experience and a track record. You know, the people that already know, like, and trust you are more likely to invest with you than uh, people who don't know you because the first thing people who don't know you want to know is what's your experience. Um, so the alternative to that Reg D Rule 506B is the other exemption, that's Reg D Rule 506C. Okay, and this 506C exemption it does allow you to freely advertise your offering, but you no longer can bring in the non-accredited investors. All of the investors have to be a verified accredited investors. So the biggest mistake that people make early on is they don't understand the difference 
and they advertise their offerings when they want to be able to bring in non-accredited investors or they advertise their offerings and they don't know they can't bring in non-accredited non investors, either one of those things will blow the exemption so that you're no longer entitled to claim it. Wow. So, you know, I want our listeners to know that we're hoping to do a, a series of shows and be, be able to get a few more uh, in-depth questions and go a little further uh, and dig a little more into some of these things you're, that Kim's talking about. But, you know, right now I wanted to ask you a little more, if you could elaborate a little more on the advertising part. And and because I, I get this question often and or different people talking about what, what I can put on social media specifically, and I'd love to hear your opinion uh, just about, you know, and, and I'll say this, um, you know, just looking on social media uh, yesterday or the day before, I seen somebody posted, you know, their, their company name and said, you know, has a new investment opportunity for their company name investors, you know, and I, I thought, well, that's, I don't know, I, I thought that was pretty bold, you know, I mean, or uh, to put it out, obviously, where just everybody can anybody and everybody can see it, it seemed more like a advertisement to everybody what they did word it to just their investors but uh, could you give us some pointers on what we can put on social media what we can't so that goes right back to which exemption are you following because exemptions are like uh, uh you know think of these like irs tax deductions right if you meet the criteria to claim the tax deduction you can go ahead and claim it and then you don't have to pay the tax on it but if you ever get audited then you have to be able to show the paperwork and prove why you were entitled to that deduction. And if you can't show that paperwork and show why you were entitled to that deduction, then the IRS is going to take it away. So the securities exemptions are the same thing. They're self-executing. You have the obligation to understand which exemption you're following and follow the rules and to document how you followed the rules in case you're ever audited so that you can prove I followed the rules for this exemption. I am entitled to claim it. Uh, so if so, number one, you got to know which exemption you're following. Are you going to follow, uh, you know, an interest state exemption, which has its own set of rules based on whatever that state thinks is the right rules for those types of offerings? Or are you going to follow the Reg D rule 506B that allows you to bring in up to 35 non-accredited investors and as many accredited investors as you want, but you can't advertise? Or are you going to do 506C where you can advertise freely? but you're restricted from including those non-accredited investors. So if that offering that you saw uh, posted was a 506C offering and it was only available to accredited investors, then that could be perfectly legitimate. You can advertise those however you want. You can uh, you know, throw flyers from a plane. You can stand up in front of a, a you know, thousand person audience. You can uh, hold an event and invite people to it and pitch your deal. You can do all of those things if you do 506C, but you cannot allow any non-accredited investors to invest. If you're doing 506B offerings, that type of an ex of a, uh, an advertisement would be completely inappropriate because you can only, it, you know, the 506B is word of mouth. You know, this is the, the this is the friends and family exemption. This is the one that allows you to talk to people that you know, but you shouldn't be email blasting. You should be calling people. You know, you should be talking about it one-on-one -on -one to your friends, to your family, to your coworkers, to people that you already know and people that already know you. No, I appreciate you explaining that. And I, I guess the most common one that I see too, uh, you know, that everybody posts is like, we just closed on this on this deal or we just closed on whatever. And, and, uh, you know, I struggle with that a little bit because, you know, I feel like your investors are already going to know you're closed. So, you know, you've closed on this deal. And how, how do you, how do you look at something like that? Well, it's the SEC that uh, views that kind of an ad. They call that a tombstone ad. And so they view that as the first step in making an offer. So again, if you're doing rule 506 C offerings, then that's okay. Nobody, you know, you, you can advertise that way. But if you're doing Reg D Rule 506B offerings, the SEC views that as the first step in making an offer. Um, but it's, you know, it's it's not a hard and fast rule, but, uh, you know, it's kind of frowned on. You know, so Kim, getting started in this business, what, you know, describe the 
the ideal client and maybe, you know, when they should contact somebody like yourself and, and what that relationship looks like? So for people that are just starting out, uh, you know, I always say the first thing you need to do is figure out what you're buying. You know, learn a, a business model, go to do some, get some real estate training, preferably get a coach. All of my most successful clients have had a coach. The people that have come back and done multiple offerings, they have all had a coach in their early years. So, you know, get a coach, get some training, follow somebody, um, get as much advice as you can so that you don't make $100,000 mistakes with other people's money. Um, once you've got that training, now go get something under contract. Get a you know, put an offer in on, uh, you know, you should be writing letters of intent as many as you can. You know, real estate is really just a numbers game. So you might put out a hundred letters of intent and you might get 10 back uh, with some interest and maybe two of them get negotiated and one of them closes. You know, I'm, these are just kind of numbers off the top of my head, but there's, there is definitely um, some, it, it is, all in the numbers as to how successful you're going to be. So you've got to write a lot of LOIs. You've got to get some deals uh, negotiated. So we suggest that people actually engage us at the point that they have a signed purchase and sale agreement. Someone from their team has physically been to the site and they have reviewed the uh, financials for the property because those are the three things that are likely to be deal killers. And the rest of your due diligence are things that you can do while we're drafting the offering documents because you want to give yourself as much time as possible to be able to successfully raise the money, especially if it's your first raise and you don't want to cut that down to where you only got 30 days to do it because then you might not be successful. Are, are there some other tips that you could give that, that person, you know, after they've had that, that purchase and sale agreement signed and, you know, they've, they've been to the property, uh, you know, how can we be the best prepared, you know, when we have that first conversation with you? Well, those are the, really the things that we need. Um, the other thing we need is to have you put together your own project, you know, investment summary, property package, whatever you want to call it. So you're taking the information and say, if it's a commercial property, you're taking the information for that the broker has provided you, and then you're putting it in your own format so that you can present it to your investors. So you're not necessarily going to believe the pro forma that the uh, real estate broker gave to you, you're going to do crunch your own numbers and you should be doing this with your coach so that you're coming up with, a, you know, a viable set of numbers that can be supported as you own this property and you do things to improve it and uh, increase the uh, net operating income. So you're going to put all that into your own property package, project summary, investment summary, whatever you want to call it. And uh, that information is what you're going to be sharing with your investors while we're drafting the offering documents. So those are, you know, you need to get that done early on uh, as soon as you've finished reviewing your financials and give that to your securities attorney so that they can use that information to start drafting your uh, your offering package as well. So, you know, what's in your offering package? That's so going to be a private placement memorandum. You're going to have to form a company that's going to buy the property. So it needs an operating agreement. You're going to have to have a subscription agreement uh, for your investors. And then uh, there's some securities notice filings that also have to be done. So, uh, Kim, what, what have you seen as being the, just the hardest part of the syndication process on, on the, of the legal aspect of it for uh, newbies, you know, that are just getting in? You know, is it those steps that you just mentioned or, or are there just a couple specific things that, well, you know, we should be studying up on or improve on as we're getting started? Well, the, I'd say that the biggest thing um, that people don't do is they don't spend enough, they don't realize they're really operating two different businesses. One of them is learning how to buy and evaluate real estate, but the other one is learning how to market and, and form and cultivate relationships with investors. So you really need to have uh, an investor marketing plan that you can begin to execute even before you have deals under contract. And so the two of them really kind of have to happen side by side so that when you've got a deal under contract, you have 
50 or maybe even 100 people that you've already talked to and you've already kind of vetted and you've developed relationships with them so that now you're free to be able to talk to them about your deal and to invite them to invest with you. If, if you do those things and have that set up in advance of getting your first deal you're not going to be scared during your first deal but if you don't have a database you don't know but you know five or six people uh and you need to raise a million and a half dollars you're going to have a tough time on your first deal could you give us a couple pointers on that investor marketing plan maybe some ways you've seen people be successful at doing that um, well, so I think that not enough people realize that that's such a critical part of what they should be doing, but the ones that have figured it out are the ones that are just going to be highly successful at raising money. Um, so, you know, that's going to entail figuring out where you're going to meet people, how you're going to gather their contact information, how you're going to follow up with those people, uh, how you're going to keep in contact with them after you follow up with them. And all of that's going to require that you have a suite of marketing tools that you can feed to them along the, the you know, development of that relationship, you know, starting with your business card, your elevator pitch, your, um, uh, you know, that property information package or property summary we were talking about, um, your company brochure, having a website having maybe at some point down the road a newsletter and a drip system so that when you do meet people you've got a system in place then you know what's going to happen i meet somebody at an event tomorrow this is this is what's going to start happening with that investor and here's how i'm going to keep them engaged i like that um so you know moving forward like uh what, what's some way that that you've maybe improved your business on the syndication side or 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 that you can recommend for people uh, to, to improve their business, you know, as far as their syndication business? Well, um, so I think that developing those marketing tools is critically important. And we learned along the way that uh, we were having a hard time helping our clients find those kinds of tools. So we've actually just launched this week our web store on our website at syndicationattorneys.com. There's a web store tab where you can see that um, what those kind of materials are that we recommend and what they include. Some of you may be able to develop these things on your own, um, but if you can't, then that's something that we can help you with also. Great. Uh, and I hope you'll elaborate a little more on that uh, in a minute. Um, but Kim, you know, what's the number one thing that's contributed to your success in this business? No, I had a really great mentor early on and I try to be that kind of a mentor for a lot of our clients and help nurture them along so that they become more confident as they do deals and they start getting better and better at it. And I, we've had several clients that have been with us for many, many, many years and have gone on and uh, had been wonderful success in their own syndication careers. And, and we'd like to see that because we know that we're not only helping that person get better in their world, but they're also helping a lot of other people in their world get better too. Great. And, you know, tell us something that you're excited about uh, right now or for the future of your company. Well, I have been writing a book for a very long time and uh, as I just sent it off to the publisher on uh, the first of the month. So on New Year's Day. So I'm excited to, that that's going to be coming out. Hopefully, you know, I figure it's going to be a several months, a couple months process to get that up and running, but uh, we're going to be making an announcement before too long that uh, we're going to have a, a book on how to syndicate that uh, all of you would do well to read, especially if you're just starting out. It's going to help give you that boost that you need so that you got a leg up and uh, you're not doing this blind or trying to figure it out piecemeal by yourself. I appreciate that. And yeah, any other books in the syndication space will be welcomed. That's for sure. And uh, I know that will be uh, a value to the listeners as well. Kim, will you tell the listener again about just your website and uh, maybe briefly about your, the web store you just mentioned and, and uh, how they can get in touch with you? Yeah, on our website, uh, it's uh, just syndicationattorneys.com. Uh, if you want to schedule an appointment with one of us, we do offer free 30-minute consultations. Uh, you can, uh, there's a button on the website almost on every page. You can just click that and schedule a free consultation. Uh, and we, while you're on that page, on the website, 
if you go to the um, free info page, there are a whole bunch of articles that are one or two pages long on all different aspects of syndication. We also have free monthly teleseminars. So if you give us your contact information uh, at the website, then we would uh, put you in our database and notify you when we've got an upcoming teleseminar. Um, we always do it on a different aspect of um, syndication. Sometimes it's me talking about something, but a lot of times we'll bring in special guests. And we also post the past teleseminars. So there's like 16 teleseminars up there already that you can listen to about just all different aspects from different experts associated with the syndication world. Uh, our frequently asked questions are probably gonna answer some of the questions that you have right now. So we've got lots of ways that you can interact with us and um, make sure that you're getting the information that you need. And then of course, when you're ready to syndicate, we would love to talk to you and love to be able to have you as our clients. Great. Thank you so much, Kim, and for the value you provide. And again, you know, to the listeners, we, we hope to have Kim back for numerous shows and to go in a little more in depth about uh, this, this part of the business that, that's so important. And uh, anyway, thanks again, Kim. Thanks again for the listeners for being with us today. I hope you'll go to lifebridgecapital.com and connect with me and also go to our Facebook group so we can all network and ask questions of experts like Kim and grow our business together. We will talk to you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.